Hi, it's Lily. Today I'm going to show you how I made my miniature tree house by hand and from scratch. I'm going to show you all the processes, all the techniques, step by step on how I made this. And I can tell you it's been a challenging one because everything is curved in this project. So I hope you're going to enjoy this tutorial. Let's get started. For my initial mock-up, I've played around with different shapes and I wasn't really satisfied until I decided to go for an egg shape. I worked with 3mm wire and some duct tape, which I've added from the inside and on the outside as well to create this kind of skin. And I've put some temporary furniture out of cardboard inside of it to get an idea of how the layout is going to work out. Initially, I thought I'm going to have a first floor with the beds and a ladder to access to it, so I can have a nicer layout on the ground floor. So that was my initial plan. I was happy with this uh, mock-up, so I decided to place it in between trees that I've built up with thick wire and some cinefoil. It's a thicker kind of aluminum foil to build up the whole mock-up because I need to see how the house will fit inside of those trees. At that point I was happy with that shape and I decided to go forward with it. I took a big sheet of plywood, 12 mm thick, and started to draw the overall shape of my deck and the position of the trees. I've cut the big piece of plywood with my jigsaw. As it's meant to be a set for stop motion animation, I always build them on studs so it's elevated and you can get underneath to access the screw underneath the puppets. So I line them up on the studs, use the nail gun to attach them together. And as you can see, it's nicely raised and you have space underneath. So now let's tackle the tree. I've installed some clamps along my table and I made sure that the overall distance between them was greater than the tree that I tried to sculpt. Then I used tons of wire going along those different lengths. You can use garden wire or any kind of wire. The color is irrelevant, it's gonna be painted later on. I wanted to make sure I have a big mass of wire. So as you can see, I've done a second bunch of those and then I press and twist them together. I've added some duct tape to make sure they stay together and then cut the wire apart. I've reused an old base to sculpt my tree. It's composed of one piece of rounded basa wood, then a piece of leftover wood and two little batten on either side to raise it. In the center you have a big hole and underneath you have a few little screws all around it. And the whole thing's gonna make sense very soon. So I've raised the bottom wire to create the exposed roots and took five or six wire in the middle of it, pass them through the hole underneath, press them tightly and then use the wires and tie them around the screws. Then I put the tree back up and I start to separate the roots and the branches. For the roots I wanted to bulk them up so I used some aluminium foil all around it to create more volume. As you can see it looks more like a spider than exposed roots at the moment. And then I went back to my cine foil because I wanted to bilk some volume quickly. I just happened to have this cine foil black mat and it's much quicker and stronger to build up volume. Then I start to work on the branches. So I took the shortest wire first, twist them together, then I separate it in half, twist them on either side, and then separate in half again, and twist them again, and separate in half, and keep going, and repeat, and again, and again, and again. And then you can cut the excess and slowly start to shape those branches. And you repeat them all along the tree going up, and there you have my main tree. I placed it next to my mock-up to make sure it was the right height and the right shape because I wanted to wrap it up around my tree house basically. I've added more aluminium foil to buck it up and I made sure I add a wire onto it so I don't have some aluminium foil flying around. They stay firmly tight. The main material I used to scum my tree is an air drying clay, DAS, which is brilliant because it's quite cheap, easy to work with and you can get some really nice detail out of it. I've also used some texture pad to create the bark. I bought this years ago in a baking shop. I'm pretty sure you can find some online. So I just apply my air drying clay all along and press it tightly to try to make sure I don't have air bubble underneath. Kept building it up, keep covering the whole tree. And then I use the texture pad to, to press into the clay. And as you can see, once you have two of them, you, you can press against each other so that is more efficient. I also like to use my sculpting tools to add some detail, like a branch that has been cut, for example, and kept building it up, adding more in between the branches and use the smaller texture pad to get in between. And now you can see what it looks like when it's all done up. I've let it dry completely and then I start painting, applying two coats of acrylic paint first in brown, 
death, play around with my sponge, applying some beige, some green, some sienna. I've applied a clear matte sealer. Then I've done a dirty wash, applying a diluted dark brown and then removing all the excess with a wet paper towel. Then I've done some dry brushing, use a tiny little bit of lighter beige and then just brushing on top of it so it will show all the highlights. Finally, I use a clear matte varnish to protect the paint. Now for the branches, I use some sea foam and I use lots of it. Usually it takes probably two boxes of sea foam to create one tree, but because this tree was massive, I think I, I used probably three boxes altogether. They come in different sizes and the first goal is to separate them into tiny little bushes, as you can see here. Then I use some super glue. I recommend the mitre bond because it's got a kicker to it. So you just apply a tiny bit of super glue, put them onto the wire and then use the kicker so that the super glue sets instantly. And you repeat this again and again, try to not stick your finger onto the branch, ideally, but that's why you need to have some gloves and spend the next few hours repeating the same task. And I start to look like something. For the next stage, I wanted to protect the main trunk, so I cover it with aluminum foil and a bit of duct tape. Then I went outside and used a scenic spray glue, try to not spray the main trunk, ideally, aim for the branches only. Then apply some coarse turf. I usually like to start with a darker color and then mix up with different color later on. I went for a second coat of the scenic spray glue and then another second or third coat of coarse turf. Try to mix up the colors, it makes it much more interesting. And now you can see the transformation. Last but not least, I use a clear matte varnish to remove the tackiness of the previous glue and hold everything together. So this act as a glue as well. You can clamp it in to make sure the turf don't fall out and stay nicely tied together. So now let's go back to the main board. As you can see, this board was connected with the previous miniature set, the abandoned shack that was supposed to be part of the story of my stop motion animation. So I've used my main tree that I put in position and then start to use the other tree that I've built in the meantime with the same process and put them in place. I wanted to reproduce my main mocha, so I've done a copy of my race platform, tried to put it in between the trees, and I've started to get an understanding of how tricky it's going to be to fit it tightly in between the trees. Then I tried to place my mock up in between and it became more and more clear that it's going to be complicated just to get in there because I wanted it to look like it was nicely hugged by the tree, but it makes it complicated to access. So once I was kind of okay with the position, I removed the trees and marked them up on my board. My biggest tree, which is the number four here, I know it's going to get heavy. So I thought I'm going to add some studs underneath to help with the load and to make sure that the board doesn't start bending in that spot. I wanted my tree to start from a raised position, so I use a leftover piece of stud and just super glue it to the board. My tree house was supposed to be along the river, so I wanted to cut a nice curve in front to add some sand and create this river front view. Now, I don't know if you're aware, but underneath your jigsaw, there's a screw that you can remove and you can adjust the plate and the angle of the cut and then use a jigsaw to create a nice cut. Then I start to build up some volume. So I use some leftover cardboard and hot glue them in place. And I kept using more cardboard to start building up the volume overall. The last thing you want to do is something completely flat. So it's much more interesting to have different heights. Then I covered the whole thing with duct tape. And it started to look much more interesting. So I drill underneath where my bay tree will be because I have wire coming from straight underneath the tree. Then I place in position once I was happy with it and use the hot glue gun and empty as much of hot glue I can underneath it, hold it firmly in place, and then use the hot glue gun to flip even more all along the edges. I kept positioning all the other trees, but those one will be removable. The main tree with the exposed roots will stay in, the three other will be removable. So for those one, I protect them with aluminum foil and duct tape and the main one has some decorator tape all along the edge of the roots. Then I use some sculptor mold. I use, I think, easily a bag of it. Mix it up with water. And then starting to apply in different batches all along and try to press it against the duct tape. After a few minutes, you can feel that it starts to set and it's getting more firm. So then you can start shaping it more accurately. I didn't aim to go for something polished and flat because nothing in nature really is. I use the spray gun with water. You can just water your finger as well. It helps smooth things up. And once it starts to set a bit more, you can use the sanding paper. Then I use some Mod Podge, matte, 
and a mixture of Thai grout and soil. I say 50-50, but honestly, it's probably a bit more grout than soil. Soil from my garden, by the way. I fill it up in an old plastic cup, and then I use some tights, so that will create a nice shaker. Then I had a various stone to work with. It's important to have them in different scale, different sizes. So first I apply a thick coat of Mod Podge throughout, and then I start to spray my little stones around the edges, play around with bigger stone throughout, and then use my shaker with a mix of grout and soil everywhere. To fix everything up, I use a mixture of isopropyl alcohol and water, 50-50, and spray throughout, and then use a mixture of matte mod podge and water and as you can see my spray nozzle is completely blocked and i'm making an absolute mess so ideally don't do what i've just shown you here but the idea is to soak it up and to leave it dry completely overnight the next day everything was dry so i started painting first i used some beige for the river bank then used some gray for what was supposed to be my path and some brown for the soil that is underneath the grass I've done dirty wash on the path, applying some diluted dark brown and removing all the excess quickly with a wet paper towel. I've had different shade with a sponge for the riverbank. And I went way too hard on this one. I should have used less uh, paint for sure. Now let's tackle the static grass. This is the applicator that I bought a while back. It works absolutely fine for this job. And I always like to have a variety of static grass between four millimeter and seven millimeter roughly. And I like to have different colors. I think it's good to have a variety of tones. So I fill my applicator with static grass, making sure I don't have too much lump in there. Then I use a thick grass glue that I apply in patches. Then I turn my applicator on and then start to apply my static grass. And as you can see, I have my little extension with the wire underneath and the current do its magic and the grass is standing up. Then I remove the excess with the vacuum. I've added a tight on top of it so that I can reuse everything that I just vacuum out for the next batch. It's great to use a variety of colors. So for the next one, I use different shade and just keep at it. Add some glue, apply the grass, remove the excess and repeat again and again. Then I mix up a variety of product. Grand Cover Soil, Pine Forest, a really good one. I use a lot soil from my garden and another forest soil a bit darker, it's good to have a variety of shade. So all along the tree, you're gonna have some soil that show up because you rarely have the grass growing against the tree. So I added some glue there and start playing around with the different shades of soil that I have to build it up. And at that stage, it was a bit dark. I went back on it and adjusted later on. I kind of knew it's gonna be likely I'm gonna have a transition line. So I removed the decorated tape and you can see the white line. So I've added a bit more glue and keep adding a bit more soil onto it to hide this transition. Then I kept at it with the other tree using as much hot glue underneath it. And then once it was in place, use some hot glue all along and then cover with soil. At that stage, it was a bit too clean, so I just play around, add more stuff here and there. And it started to look more interesting, I think. I kept going, adding more bushes. Now, to set the whole thing together, I used my mixture of isopropyl alcohol first, and then the mixture of Mod Podge and water to basically soak the whole thing. And if you have too much glue showing up, especially against the tree trunk, remove it with a paper towel and then let it dry completely overnight. Now that I've got the base and the trees, let's look at the platform or raised deck. I've placed a rough cardboard template in between, and as you can see, there's quite a gap in the other trunk. So I decided I'm gonna punch a hole, place some little stick of wood, cut the excess, and apply a bit of tape above it. So I've got something of a base to work with. Then I've applied a sheet of aluminum foil, and this is the one I've used to actually shape the template that I wanted. And as you can see, I've got much more detail of the trees and where they touch the platform. So this became my new template. I copied it onto a piece of uh, reused foam board and cut it with a stainless knife. Then I position it in between my trees and I can see straight away I'm gonna have an issue getting it in there. So the right way to do it is actually to separate into two parts. I knew where my house is gonna be, so it was easier to separate in diagonal because most of this transition will be hidden underneath the tree house. Then I cut it with a stainless knife and try it out. It took a bit of adjustment, but it works much better that way. 
So I have my main template, now I need to decide where I'm going to put my beam in which direction to hold the floorboards above them. And I use a big marker pen to mark them out. So there you can see I have my central beam, then I have the outer beam and all the ones that are connected to those elements together. So I've worked with, I believe it was a four or five millimeter thick uh, basil wood, cut them into little button. Then I cover my template with some parchment paper or baking paper and duct tape it in place. And then I took my little piece of wood, cut them out, send them down and super glue them together. And because I've got the baking paper underneath, it's not going to stick to the template. And I kept building up, adding more button, cut them to size, super glue them together. And there you have it. I've got the whole structure holding nicely and tightly together and I can lay my floorboards above it. For the floorboard, I use a sheet of basil wood that I age with a screwdriver to mark some line onto it first. Then I cut some plank out of it. And then I took my time to cut them to size, shape them nicely so they can sit on the edge on the studs underneath. That will make more sense. Once I have a nice shape, then I add a tiny drop of super glue along the joist and press it firmly. Just keep building up all along. When all was assembled, I just sand down the edges. I forgot to bevel the edge of the floorboard on either side, so I used a nail file and went in between to try to create more space in between them. Then I tried back in and it took a bit of adjustment to have a nice tight fit. Once I was happy with that, I start painting. First I paint underneath and I apply two coats of acrylic paint. Then I've done a dirty wash, applying a darker diluted brown paint and remove the excess with a wet paper towel straight away. And lastly, I use a tiny bit of lighter beige and a large brush and remove almost all of it and went against the grain to create all the highlights. So now I have my platform and I have my tree. I tried to bring my mock-up back into it and boy, there was not enough space. I started to realize, okay, it's gonna need some adjustments. So I placed my puppet back just to get an idea of scale. And yes, it's gonna take some severe adjustment. I knew some branches need to be bent. So luckily I have some wire into it. I can bend it. It's gonna open up the clay underneath, but you can fix that up later on. That's not the end of the world. Just a bit of paint and no, no one's gonna see it. So I've copied the base of my main mock-up onto a piece of cardboard with a permanent marker and cut it out, position it onto my deck and realize, okay, it needs to be wider and it needs to tie it against the tree much better. So I've used some aluminum foil to create my real templates. Then I copied this template onto a new piece of cardboard, try it out. This was much better than before. And then I start wondering about the layouts, where it's going to be the door, where it's going to be the kitchen cabinet. I've decided at that point that I'm going to separate the main base into two parts and working out the layout with the permanent marker really help to get the decision of where I need to cut this. I thought about the element that needs to be there, the desk, the little sofa. I position it back in place, put my puppets for size and realize I'm going to need to have a bed upstairs and it's getting really, really tight. So I knew I'm going to have to cheat heavily on this project. But anyway, I kept going and used my cardboard template to copy it onto a piece of nine millimeter plywood, cut it out. And as you can see now, I have my two part, the back part that fits tightly in between the trees and the front main part of my house. To connect those two parts, I use some wooden dowel and I first mark a line where the wooden dowel will be connected on those two boards. Use the drill, the same size as the dowel and carefully drill on my plywood, that's why you need to have some thickness to work with, and drill on the other side as well. It's important that one side is tight with the dowel and the other side is a bit more loose because you come, it's gonna come in and out a lot and just make sure it fits nicely when it's assembled. Now I've used my drill bit to drill way more holes all along. And if you wonder what I'm doing, it's gonna start to make sense very soon. So I've used some thick wire, three meter thick, dip into super glue and then press it onto the hole that I've just drilled out. And then I start to shape up and you probably see what I'm doing. I'm basically creating like a basket structure and I start to weave my house with those wire. Start to decide what is exactly the size of the windows, where does it start, where does it end, and just play around with the wire, free flowing, just try to basically sculpt my house as I go. Try to make it as tight as possible and fill the gap. 
I went back in between the trees to make sure everything is nicely positioned and makes sense all together. I was worried about the space between the wire and the trunk on either side, there's a bit of a gap there. So I've used more wire and I start build up as you can see, so I have some kind of structure underneath that is getting close to the tree. And then to cover this, I will usually use some kind of aluminium mesh, even though this one I had was a bit tight. But I thought I'm gonna go experimental on this one. I have this Varafoam Light, which is a thermoplastic that I bought a while back, and I never really experimented on a big scale with it. So I thought that's the project for it. But if you don't have it, an aluminium mesh will do the job as well. So I warm up my thermoplastic mesh on a piece of baking paper because it was about to get very, very sticky and then apply onto my structure. And at that stage, I realized, well, it stick mainly to my fingers, but it's hard to get it to stick to itself and to the structure uh, that I've made with wire. So it's going to be harder than what I thought and planned. But quickly I found one trick, is actually to use the baking paper, which is probably the only thing that this mesh doesn't stick to, and use it itself so that I can wrap nicely the mesh around the wire. And that was perfect. It made my job much easier. I've cut out the windows and the door, kept warming up the thermoplastic. You can go back and forth with the heat gun and then wrap it all along the doorway and the window frame. And here it is all done up and I let it cool completely down. Now to cover the whole mesh, I use Sculptamol, the same that I used previously for the main board of the outside scenery. Mix it up with water and then I've applied on both sides at the same time to make sure you go through the mesh. Press it firmly and make sure it's connect on either side and then you can start to flatten it as you can see with my finger here. And after a few minutes you can start to work with it much better because it starts to slowly set. Then I use some water on my finger. You can spray some water as well. It helps smooth things up. I wanted to try it out in between the trees, but with the plaster, it started to get really messy. So I cover everything up with aluminum foil and duct tape. So everything is protected. And I went back with one part of my house first. And as I expected, it was hard to fit in there. So you need some adjustment with the stain knife and some sanding paper until I have a nice fit. And then I went, and took the bigger part of the house and tried to squeeze it back in. I can see there how tight it's gonna be. One area of concern was just against the trunk because I knew it's gonna be of a gap and it's gonna be a more fragile part because it's the edges, but I kept adding a bit more of the sculpt mold there to try to build it up. Then I used sanding paper a lot to try to smooth things up and try to speed up the process. You can go back and forth with a heat gun, but honestly, it's going to take a week to dry out. So take that into consideration, unless you live in a really hot and warm area. But I'm in UK, that's not the same situation here. While that was drying, I started to work on the bed. So I made a template with aluminum foil, copied it onto a piece of basil wood. I think it was probably three or four millimeter thick. Cut it out with my saw and sand the edges try to fit it in place, realize I need to cut a little notch into the sculptimal to have a nicer fit. Now by the time I wanted to work on the roof, I ran out of the 3mm wire, so I start to grab everything I can. I have this flat wire, I thought okay that's gonna do the job, and I started shaping it. I was trying to follow the edge of my shape and sculpt the wire to fit it. Then I've used more wire and tried to create a very rough roof structure and I use my mock-up to help with shaping this. As you can see, it's not really pretty, but it doesn't matter. I just need to have some kind of structure to begin the work on the roof. So I've applied this structure on my main shape and adjust and shape this further so that I can fit better. I wanted to have a clear dome at the top of my roof, so I use some clear warbler, which is a thermoplastic I use absolutely all the time. And I use a random container because it was roughly the right size. I warm up the warbler, position it onto the top of my container, and then press it gently with baking paper to try to protect the plastic as much as possible. And at some point, like, you know what, I, I wish I had the perfect round shape to press into it, but instead I just grab whatever I have, which is just a big roll of tape, and try to help shaping it. And it works. I let it cool down completely and cut the edges. Now I wanted to see how my roof structure will look in between the trees. And as you can see, it's getting tighter and tighter every time. But anyway, I start to work out on the top windows where you can see the bed through and to check that it's a nice position 
with the windows underneath. Then I use some leftover cine foil. If you have just aluminum foil, that's absolutely fine. And I kept building it up to have a nice shape. I wanted the curve of the roof to go along and above the windows and above the door frame as well. And then I went back to my favorite thermoplastic, Wobla. You knew that was coming, isn't it? And I started to warm up a big piece of it until it was really nice and soft. And then I apply onto my mock-up of a roof. And I try to make sure it stay warm because I need to apply two coats of Wobla throughout. So it doesn't matter if it's not pretty, if it's patchy, that's, it doesn't matter as long as you have two coats throughout. So I was warming up more pieces, but at the same time keeping the main shape warm so that it will bond together. The Wobla stick to itself as long as it's hot. So keep all parts warmed up all along and press them together so that it bond nicely. If it's not pretty, don't worry, you're here just to create a main structure at that stage. Then I cut the edges and then I can remove all the insides, the cinephile and the wire and put it back in. Oh, that started to look like something. And I went all along the edges with a permanent marker to mark where the sculpt mold shape underneath will touch the warbler. Okay, now let's tackle the roof cover or shake. To create that, I used some piece of basil wood, probably two, three meters thick. And as usual, I aged the wood with a screwdriver first to mark some grain into it. And then I start to cut the shake, as you can see, with my screwdriver. Because I didn't want to have a clean, perfect line with the stainless knife. I want to have the edges bevel so you can have a separation in between them. And I want it to look like it's hand cut. So have those rubbly, not perfectly straight line. It was part of the look that I was going for. Then I've applied a line with my hot glue gun and position my piece of basil wood on top of it. As you can see, I've got some reference line underneath, so I know exactly where I need to go with the hot glue. And then once the hot glue is cold, you can remove it, cut it. I cut it into a section of 20 mil, most of it, and 10 mil for some of the edges. And as you can see, it looks quite rough. It needs some cleanup, but you got the structure that is bendable to go all along the curved roof, but at the same time, it's all together at the top. And I repeat the same thing again and again. I got into the factory line kind of mood and it started to get better. And you need so many of them. So get a little system going so that it can get quicker and create lots of them because I can guarantee you're gonna need more than what you think. Then I was finally able to assemble the roof. So I took some of the section that was shorter, 10 millimeter long, and I hot glue onto the edge to hide the wall blood. That was my first mission. Then I directly apply some hot glue on top of it and apply a second section, the normal size 20 mil long above it and make sure they connected nicely so that they hold together and hide the wall blood at the same time. And then I just kept building, adding more hot glue and more strips of my little piece of basil wood. It started to get a bit more tricky as I went up, as I want them all to connect at the same level on the top dome. Uh, and yeah, I, I needed some adjustment to get there. I positioned my dome temporarily and used the smaller section, the 10 millimeter long one, to create a border all along. And this is what it looks like when it's hot glue in place. Now for the inside of the roof, I use some coconut fiber. I have those left over for the cottage to Toyo, as you probably remember it. I've used quite a lot of them, but I thought it's gonna create a nice texture for the inside of my roof. And if you work with them and a hot glue gun, what you're gonna need is to protect your finger. That's why I use those silicone figure that you can find really cheap on the internet and I can guarantee they're gonna save your finger from getting burned. So I've used the hot glue gun, apply plenty of it and then press, this is why you need the silicone fingers, so that it holds onto the glue underneath. Cut it out and repeat the whole thing until everything is covered. That was my initial stage. I went back to it later and add further uh, coconut fiber. Then I have my big gap all along the dome and I knew that I need to fill that up. So I use my warbler, the classic type, warm it up, double it. So as you can see, I have two layers now. And then I keep it warm and wrap up the top part. And then I wrapped up the bottom part so they meet in the middle and the seam will be at the back so it disappear. So that means I create a thick strip of this warbler that I can shape all around my dome and hide the transition. I cut it out, remove it because it's easier to blend the cuts on the mats and just warm it up, press it together. And then once I was happy with the transition being sculpted out, at least roughly, I went back and positioned it against the dome. 
Then I've applied another strip of Wobbler. I wish looking back that I've done this one a bit thinner than the initial one, but you know what? It did the job. It hide the transition and it hide the glue that was showing in between the coconut fiber. I will also add a thinner strip all along the top of the dome, once again to hide the transition. And I've added one as well along the window. Now I was ready to get painting, so I wanted to make sure I protect the dome with some frog tape or decorated tape on the outside and on the inside by applying aluminium foil. Then I've added lots of different shade. I like this part because you can play around with different colors and you don't need to be precise. Just add some random red and gray and beige and brown. And I just keep building it up with some acrylic paint. Then I've applied a clear matte sealer and then the dirty wash begins. So I apply a diluted dark brown acrylic paint all throughout, make sure it got in between really nicely in between the shakes, and then remove it straight away with some wet paper towel. Make sure you have plenty of wet paper towel before you start this task and remove all the excess straight away. And you're gonna see the transition. It's incredible how it starts to come together, but you still have those different shades showing underneath. And work in small section at a time is much better because time is of the essence. And I was really pleased with how it turned out. I just added a bit of dry brushing by using a very little amount of paint on my brush, on a large brush, and then just brush all the edges. Finally, I seal it with a clear matte varnish. Okay, now let's tackle the window. I've positioned my main shame onto some foam to make sure it's not gonna damage it while I play around with the windows. And then I place some aluminum foil all around, press it with my finger to create a template, use the permanent marker to mark it up, and then cut it out with a scissor. Copy it onto a piece of cardboard, cut it out, and then position the cardboard in place. Try to make sure that it's tight. It should stay there and not go through. Once I have this in position, I use a piece of white warbler and I warm it up and roll it like a little snake. And just make sure you keep warm it up and you keep shaping it and you can create something really nice and sculptable. I love this material for that. It can do so many different things. So I just keep warming and keep rolling. And I also use a metal ruler to add pressure on it and also to press it once, as you can see, just flatten a little bit. And then I position it all along my window, hoping that the cardboard stay in place so that I can shape all the edges and the frame of the window. Keep warming it up, keep shaping it until you have the shape you want. Let it completely cool down and there you have it. Then I have to repeat the whole thing for the inside. So I turn it upside down to make sure you have some foam underneath to protect it and warm up another piece of warbler, roll it up like a little snake and went back at it. I needed to copy my template onto a piece of clear plastic. So I use a permanent marker to do it and cut it out with a scissor. I repeat the same procedure to create the whole door frame. I use a bit of cardboard as a template use two piece of warbler. It's the mesh version of warbler, but honestly, any type of warbler you have will do. I use two pieces that I warm up and stick to each other. So I have a double layer, it's thicker, and it's gonna hold the shape. Then I copy my template onto this piece of warbler with a permanent marker, cut it out, and then I just keep it warm and position it nicely onto the cardboard, just so that it follow the curve. To create the template for the floor, I use a piece of aluminium foil and press it all along the edges, like you've seen me done templates on many other parts of this project. Went along with a permanent marker, cut it out, copy onto a piece of cardboard, cut it and adjust it until it's a nice fit. Then I use a piece of balsa wood, edge it with a screwdriver like I usually do, cut it into length, and then I bevel the edges with a nail file on either side. I've applied a thick coat of PVA throughout and then I slowly build up my wooden floor, bits by bits. If there are parts that stick out, it doesn't even matter because you have the main template to work with. So you can leave them sticking out, that's absolutely fine. And just keep building it up. And once you're really happy about it, apply a sheet of baking paper and then press some heavy books on top of it to make sure that it's at some weight and leave it dry overnight. So the next day I can remove the baking paper turn it around and cut all the excess wood around my template and sand down the edges with some sanding paper. Then I've applied two coats of acrylic paint, sprayed with a clear matte sealer. 
apply a dirty wash with some diluted brown acrylic paint and then remove it straight away with some wet paper towel. Make sure you have all the paper towel wet around you so you can easily grab them and remove the paint as quickly as possible. And finally apply a coat of clear matte varnish. By then it's been a week and the wall of my main house were kind of dry, but I can see that there was more texture than what I expected. I did sand it down, I tried to smooth it up, but I still have quite lots of lump and I wasn't too pleased with that. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna try to find something. And I decided to mix some plaster and some water and to apply a coat of plaster over it and to smooth it up with my fingers. And I'm so glad I did because it made a huge difference. I wait a few hours and then sand it down and have a much smoother surface. Then before I was able to apply my first coat of proper paint, I apply a first coat of well diluted with lots of water in it to make sure that uh, the paint on top of it will attach properly. Once all that was painted, I've super glued my wooden floor. Then I've positioned my temporary furniture in cardboard and my little puppets and realized how much in denial I was because clearly I will not be able to put a first floor. As you can see, as I put my timber on top of it, it's already touching the head. There is not enough clearance here so I should have spent more time prepping and making sure the layout worked properly with the heights so I had to adjust things which made me realize I need to cut down my kitchen so that I have more space for the bed. I took my initial mock-up for the kitchen and calculated roughly the depth that I need to build up with cardboard so I cut a few pieces of cardboard and used a hot glue gun to attach them together and sandwich all of them. Once I have the proper thickness together I position it against the wall, make sure it was a nice fit, and start gluing some pieces of basil wood against it. So the first layer is for what's going to be visible underneath at the skirting board. Then I've added a piece at the end, and I start to focus on the worktop. I did first a mock-up of the worktop with aluminium foil, copy it onto cardboard, and once I was happy with the cardboard shape, I copy it onto a piece of thick basil wood. I place it in position and then realize my window was way too low. Once again, I should have spent more time in planning and calculate that my window should have been higher up. But anyway, I thought I'm gonna make it work with what I've got right now. So I kept building up with more pieces of basil wood that I've sent down all around the edges to create the cabinet door. For the sink itself, I've cut a piece of warbler bigger than the whole of my sink, warm it up, place it onto the shape, gently curve it and shape it. Once it was completely cold, I can remove it from the shape, mark the center and start to mark all around the shape that I wanted so I can cut it out. Now it starts to look like something. I needed to drill in the middle of it for the drain. For the handles, I've used some three millimeter aluminum wire and I shaped it first with my fingers because I wanted to have a nice curve in the middle. Once I had the curve, I can then fold the edges with a jewelry plier on either side to create this nice shape. It almost looked like a staple with just a gentle curve. And once I had painted all my cabinet, I can super glue the door on top of it. Then I went back to the bed. Initially, I made a template with aluminum foil to follow the curve of the wall. Then I built up with different sheets of basil wood to create this shape with some added basil wood at the front to create some drawers. I built up a volume for the head of the bed. As you see underneath, I just used some leftover piece of basil wood because nobody's going to see it, so it doesn't matter. I just needed it to stand up. I need to adjust it quite a few times until it fits nicely against the wall. Then I've painted it and age it. Now let's talk about the stove. I've done a few stoves in the past and I wanted to work on a different shape on this one. So I drew a little sketch on the right scale and I found a little glass jar that is exactly the right size. So I thought that's perfect. I decided to work with warbler and cut a piece that is long enough to go around the glass jar twice. I warm it up, press it all along the shape and go along it twice, cut the excess and press the excess back in. Then I do the stain knife while it was still warm and cut the round opening at the middle of it. Once it was completely cold, I can remove it from the jar. And as you can see, I have a nice shape. Then I took another piece of warbler to create the outer component. Warm it up with a heat gun, fold it in half so I have a thicker layer to work with and I like to use the metal ruler to press it. Then I went around my little glass jar again, 
to follow the template of my drawings underneath. While that was cooling down, I warm up yet another piece of warbler, fold in half to make it stronger, and then apply it on a different glass jar, which was just a bit bigger, and let it cool down. Then I've cut my template with a scissor. I've used yet another piece of warbler, warm it up and fold it in half, press it down, and then I could use my little template to press against the warbler. And once it was a little bit cooler, I can cut it with a scissor. Then I warm it up and press the outer shape onto it so that they bond together. Then I was able to super glue the main volume inside of that shape and also super glue the extra part at the bottom of it, which was cooling down on the larger jar. Then I needed to flute, so I used a piece of basa wood, drill with the biggest drill bit, and I made a mess with that one, so I had to correct it and fix it with the standing knife until I had a nice fit into it. And that left a bit of a gap, unfortunately, so I knew I'm gonna use the oldest trick of all, use a bit of warbler, warm it up, roll it, and then hide it. And that was my strategy all along this project. If there's a little bit of a gap, use some warbler, warm it up and fill it up. Now for the door of the stove, I've used some warbler, warm it up, fold in the top and fold the bottom of it, as you can see, and press the metal ruler so I have a nice shape and the seam is in the middle, which is gonna be at the back of the door. Then I use my templates for reference and I shape all my little door inside of it. So I had my little door shape up and I needed to use one of those tiny hinges. And it's always a bit tricky to get the right position to make sure that it open and close correctly. So it was a bit of a fight, but I got there in the end. I need to apply some black gesso to prime it and then a bit of a metal paint. So I've added a little piece of black wire, as you can see here, and it's just bended as a U shape and it helps close off the stove and I've also added a piece of clear plastic inside of it for the glass of the door. Finally I've added some tiny branches that I hot glue together. Now when it comes to the rest of the furniture I build them all out of basa wood with some super glue. I went for a very simple design and just make sure everything was right up to scale. And if, like me, you use some super glue with some basa wood, make sure you prime it with white gesso before applying the paint. Now I've positioned most of my components in place. I start to think about the shelf and the fact that I need to curve it to go along the wall. I also wanted to have a little hot plate next to it. So to build that up, I've used some warbler as usual, fold it up twice, then fold all the edges. And to create the nice plate or round disc, I've used some leather tools and they are quite useful for this kind of material actually. And I use the other smaller punch, which are great to create the feet of the hot plate and also some button to switch on the hot plate from the side. Now going back to my main floor, I need to have a skirting board to hide all the edges. So it's such a curvy shape that I had no choice but to go back to warbler. I use the classic warbler, fold it in half, make sure it's well pressed and then warm it up and press it all along the edges and I took my time with that. I super glued the door frame and window frame that I previously did out of warbler, and unfortunately there was quite a bit of a gap all around it, so I needed to fix that up. I've used some paper sand relief, which is not a filler, but I use as a filler, and I fill up all the gap, and then I grab some Q-tips that I dip in water, remove all the excess, and smooth it up. For the door itself, I use those tiny hinges with the shape that I previously built out of two layers of warbler, position my little hinges, and then I was running out of basa wood. So I use a piece of card. It's not as good, but you know what? I made it work with what I had. I've cut it into plank and then super glue them all along my door. Cut the excess with a standing knife, sand it down, repeat on the other side. As you can see, the card react not as well as Baza would, and there's a bit of damage to it, but I was going for the age look anyway, so I thought, okay, you know what? It's gonna work fine. Then I apply some tracing paper onto it, use a pen and create a little template, and then prime and paint the door. So while that was drying, I work on the iron on gray. I create a little template with a permanent marker, and then I place this template underneath a sheet of baking paper. Then I use yet again warbler, warm it up, and roll it and use it almost like a clay. So basically I shape it, and with my finger, I try to follow the design that I've just decided underneath. 
It's great to use your finger, but sometimes it's best to grab some sculpting tool and just getting into those tiny details. And the key is to keep warming it up. So I went back and forth with the heat gun and tried to keep it as warm as possible so that I can sculpt the whole design. As you can see, it looks quite cute by the end of it. It's always a bit tricky to have to repeat the same pattern and try to make it look similar full time, but I got there in the end and I was able to super glue them to the door and age all of it to make it look realistic. Now going back to my kitchen, for the top at the sink, I've created with some thick wire at the top, some tiny little beads super glued together and the tiniest washer at the bottom, as you can see. Then I've primed it and paint with two coats of acrylic paint, super glue it onto my kitchen. And then the important key is to age everything. So I went along with some diluted brown acrylic paint and then grab quickly some wet Q-tips and remove most of it. I sometimes use different colors of dirty wash. As you can see here, I've got a diluted dirty beige kind of color. And I prefer to use this kind of tone against white walls because otherwise the dark brown will show a bit too much. And as you can see, I've aged the whole kitchen in the cabinet and it started to come together. Now when I come to the curtain, there's a trick I use all the time is relying on aluminium mesh. I use some aluminium mesh that are quite flexible. I double it. As you can see, I fold the edges. It's also make it easier to get it into the little pocket that I prepared earlier. And once I've got the aluminium mesh inside of it up to the edge, I can fold the top and then I can shape the fabric and it will take exactly the fold I want. Then I've used some black wire for the curtain pole and I needed to make a hole at the top of it. So I use a punch and I went through it to be able to pass the wire. Then I curved the wire around the wall and super glued the top of the curtain. Instead of having to fight to super glue the wire itself, it's only held by the top of the fabric. I also needed to use some fabric for the bed. First, I needed to create a mattress. So I made a template of the bed, copied onto a piece of packaging material that I reused, cut it, sent down all the edges to smooth it up. It wasn't quite thick enough. So I used a piece of felt that I hot glue all along to create more volume. And then I used some fabric to glue all around it and make sure it was a nice fit. And then I super glue it to the base. Now I'm going to talk about the lighting. I mainly created them with warbler, once again, in three different parts. First part, I warm up a piece of warbler and wrap up around a piece of thick wire. S gently curve it and let it cool down. Then for the second part, I warm up yet another piece of warbler, shape it around the biggest bowl that I can find and press it gently then grab my standing knife and while it was still warm i cut a mark all around it the third component is supposed to be a light bulb so i use clear warbler for this one warm it up and gently press it and stretch it around a smaller bulb than before and similar as previously done i use the standing knife to go all around it while it's still warm for the light itself, I use some micro LEDs that you can find very easily on Amazon or eBay. I've grouped five or six together, press the wire together. And as you can see, I've passed the little warbler tube that I've created previously, press it and hide all my wire into it. Then I took the second part and drill at the bottom of it so I can pass my little LED through it. So I have those two components assembled. I need to add the glass on top of it. So the trick I use is usually an old sculpting tool with some blue tack at the end of it. I press onto the light bulb, then gently dip it into super glue and press it onto my lamp. And there you have it, first lamp done. Now I've got more wire to use and obviously there's gonna be more LEDs in the way. So some of them needs to be hidden. For that, I use some duct tape and wrap a few coats around it to make sure they disappear. The first one is for the desk area. Then the wire go to the outside part above the door for the porch of the house. And then two more lights above the kitchen. Then I've added plenty more details inside of it. An easy one is to use some white plastic and to create some socket and switches with that. On the outside of the house, I've used some miniature vine that I've super glue in place. It's always a bit of a fight because it tends to stick to everything but where I want it to stick. And I've reused some pots and flower that I created for the conservatory. I don't know if you've seen this other tutorial of mine. Finally, I've made a little fence with some willow. I initially made a mock-up with cardboard and then I build up the willow with super glue. And then I found some thread that was the closest color to a piece of rope to attach the branches of willow together. 
And there you have it, the set is all done. Thanks for watching this tutorial, I hope you've enjoyed it. Next time I'm going to show you some behind the scene of the photo shoot with the setup and the lighting equipment that I've used to achieve those images. Take care, bye bye.